above all other gods. We lay our down and worship you. Oh, we lift above all other gods. We lay our crown and worship you. Oh, glorious God, we praise your name. glorious God we lay a crown to worship you we thank you for another day we thank you for what you are doing in this church we thank you for what you are doing in the life of your people and we thank you for the privilege to be in your presence today Lord I am praying that for as many that are sick in their body you will heal them in the name of Jesus as many as want the word of revelation and wisdom, you will give it to them. Amen. As many as are far out from you, you will drag them back to yourself. Amen. I pray that no man, no woman will live here the same way they have come. In the name of Jesus. Be seated in God's presence. I am, I'm always, it's always a privilege to be with uh, my family here. Um, you know, you have a family, aren't you? Yes. Unless if you are new, there are so many new faces. But this is my local, local church in uh, South London. And uh, to be with my brother, uh, Pastor Kola, and his dear wife, and the family. And so it's good to see many old faces as well. God is good. All the time. All the time. Because that is what? That is his nature. <laughs> Please. If you kind enough, open your Bible to the book of Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from verse 15 to 17 in the ESV version. Then we look at the Amplified version. And I will explain why this particular Bible text is so key. It's about the, I call it the tripod stand, the three legs in which thanksgiving stand. Not on one leg, not on two legs, but on three legs. If you imagine this thing standing in front of me, this timer. It's got three legs. And on top of these uh, three legs, then they have this particular timer. So I call it the tripod stand of thanksgiving. So not one leg, it will stand. Not two legs, it will stand. It takes the three legs to stand. So Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Colossae. And he was writing to them for them to understand the importance, the power of thanksgiving. And what it means, not just what we say, but how we practice thanksgiving. There is the theory of thanksgiving that we say, but then there is the practice of thanksgiving. And so he started in verse 15 of the ESV version. They will go to the Amplified version. Say, and let the peace of Christ, pay attention. He said, peace of Christ rule in your heart. To which indeed you are called in one body. And then be what? Be thankful. So the first thing he said, for anybody to be thankful in your heart, you must have the peace of God. To rule in your hand. That means everything doesn't need to be at peace around you. But you need to have the peace. And that peace of God, which is an umpire in your heart, makes you to stand in a place of thanksgiving. Verse 16. Second leg. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness. In your heart. It means that uh, apart from the peace of God that makes it. So first it's in your mind. In your mind. You must, thanksgiving comes first from where? Your mind. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So he said it comes first from your mind. If it, if it cannot come from your mind. It's a lip service that is false. So the second thing is that it has to come from your what? 
from your mouth, by the way you sing, by the way you read the word, by the way. So there's an expression from the mind, there's an expression from the mouth. And then he told, verse 17, and he said, and whatever you do, you do. In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, check out those three legs. The first leg is what? From your heart. The second one from where? Your mouth. The third one is from what you do. It's a triple stand. Not one leg will do it. It's the three legs. So, thanksgiving as we see it, is an external expression of what is in your, you see, it's an inner gratitude that you express. Expressed by your external singing. Because you can't sing and dance of what you have not settled in your heart. And then you cannot sing and dance with what you settled in your heart without expressing it in action. So this peace of God that we are talking about, it inspires a praise party within you, within you, before you even say it. Now, what is peace? Peace is not the absence of chaos. Peace is settled in the midst of chaos. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So, a great man asked somebody to paint a picture of peace for him. So, the artist went and painted a board and everything settled around. Everybody lay down. Things were peace. He looked at the picture. He said, that's not a picture of peace. Take it away. He painted another one with everything, you know, a beach, everybody coming down, hugging each other. He said, that's not peace. He said, but what is the peace? What, what, what peace? Then he painted the third one of a bird on a tree. Other trees are falling. Winds are blowing. There was elder skelter, eater, teeter, and the bird was just calm. He said, that is peace. Hallelujah. Am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. So, peace of God is your ability to be calm. In the midst of chaos. So, Apostle Paul is now saying that if you can give thanks to God in the midst of that, then you understand what he's talking about. Hallelujah. I don't understand, you know, because so, sometimes you have to understand that it is not when all is well that you give thanks. Sometimes things are not going well. But they are not going well, but you have the peace. See, those who doesn't know their God run Elta Skelter during the time of crisis. If you know your God, you are settled and you are peace. Everything is going all around. See, one time I was, uh, I was traveling in northern Uganda with, with Pastor Abu, and uh, we were in a plane. One of those small planes that doesn't take much people. We are doing mission in there. That plane takes maybe about four or five people. Everybody's in first class <laughs> in that plane, you know. In fact, you wind down the, you wind down the glass in the plane while you are in the here, right? Yes, yeah, that's how small it is. So we are flying. It's not one of these planes with all the gadgets. You know, the pilot has his compass and everything. And then, we, when we're going, the plane have not landed there in a long time. And we're expected to land in a place called Kidgum in northern Uganda. And the pilot then said to us that we can't find a landing strip. And the fuel is terribly low. So, I now said to him, explain it in English properly. He said, if you can't find a landing strip in the next five to ten minutes, we will, we will go down. I said, no, no, what do you mean? He said, as in, we're done. We're shish kebab. <laughs> ah. I said, in the middle of uh, Uganda, they will not even see my path. Because it's in a thick of a forest where nobody's some lion hungry, say thank you, Jesus. You know, that kind of a thing. All, all manners of things were going through my mind. And as I sat down there with Pastor Agu, who is my we traveling on this mission together, and he was laughing. And he was shaking his leg, he was laughing. I'm like, so the other guy that was traveling with us, Pastor Gabriel Eziashi, who sang uh, who sang that song, you know. Aga Aka, you know, he was sitting in the front with the pilot. He started to like if Death has not come, but he was already practicing the death. If he hears this thing, he will kill me. <laughs> you know, he was, he was like, <laughs> you know, and things like that. You know, as he starts with the pilot. 
And then my pastor, pastor who was sat with me, he was just shaking his leg and smiling. I said, did you hear what the man said? He said, ah. He said, Revy, this is how we're going to end it. He said, it's not bad at all. <laughs> he said, it's not bad. At least we are doing the gospel. And then they said, these people, they went down doing the gospel. And he was just smiling and shaking his leg. I'm like, so who should I follow? The one that is afraid? <laughs> or the one that is confident? Because I just don't understand why the man was calm. And then, a few minutes later, the pilot said, I can see a clay strip, a clay strip. And then we saw some people in there. Eventually, because oftentimes, death comes before death. To scare you, that's not going to happen. It creates fear, intimidation, throws everything at you. So you even lose hope in the journey, whereas nothing is going to happen. That was how we find the, we find the hair strip. So I now ask him later, but what makes you to be confident and comfortable. He said as he sat there, he was just thanking God and said, God, it's not a bad idea. That is your job I'm doing. And if I have to go home like this, not a bad one. And, and he was just thanking, he said he was just thanking God. I said, there is a different level of a peace in the midst of chaos. Are you hearing to me? Yes. That is when you are faced with death, not even job, not even the issues of life. Death is staring at your face. Because thanks given from the heart is the ultimate solution to anxiety. So, Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, Philippians 4, 6 to 7. He said, do not fret or anxious about anything. But he said, in every circumstance and in everything, he said, by prayer and what? Petition, that is definitely a request, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. And he said, then the peace of God, that was past all understanding. So, Apostle Paul said, don't be anxious for anything. Anything is what? Anything. They reckon that something has happened to you, eh, and then what? I'm not anxious. I'll just pray. Petition. And hand it over to God. And then he said the peace of God. You see, we said the peace of God which passes all understanding. That means nobody can understand what that peace looks like. He said the peace of God. You see, when you can understand, the, you can understand your own peace, but you can't understand the peace of God. That's why I said the peace of God that passed what? All understanding. Your human imagination cannot define the peace of God. It passed all reasoning. He said that peace will not protect. One version said it will garrison your mind. What does it mean? It means that there is a protection. Hallelujah. So when the anxiety comes, it means the peace of God. He said, no, no, I can't get in. So because there, it has garrisoned, it has protected your mind from all of that. So every attack, everything comes, I'm going to take it. He said, the peace of God, he missed it. He said, so that's why you should know what? Be anxious about anything. Anxiety kills people. You go to a doctor, they said they find something or whatever. And you know, there's a way this thing can catch you. I did a blood test the other day. And then they will send a report to you. And they look at everything, he said, uh, uh, Abnormal, abnormal. Blood, this one abnormal, that one abnormal. Almost about 80 things they put there is abnormal. I said, we, we, everything is abnormal. My, me, I'm abnormal. <laughs> you can't say everything is abnormal. So they said, okay, I will go, I should go and <laughs> see the doctor, whatever. So the doctor rang me. I said, everything looks abnormal. But I can tell you, I am very normal. <laughs> very, very normal. There is nothing abnormal. So the, you know, she now said to me that uh, oftentimes, when the thing is just about a little bit skew off, the, she said, that machine is stupid. He said, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything, there's nothing wrong. So, just, so can you imagine, it took one week before I met the doctor. From the time he read abnormal. How many of you know, if they do a blood test, they say every eight things your body is abnormal, you're already dead. Because you're just thinking that, uh, hey, so who, who, what do I do with my life? Whereas nothing is wrong with you. So the enemy has a way of stealing your joy, of stealing your peace. Or stealing everything that you have. And it will give you a false one, which is the anxiety of life. So the anxiety makes you have what you don't even have. In the midst of being anxious, do you know you can, you can, you can feel that you are well and you'll be unwell? But when you say, no way, that's not for me, you enter into a new dimension, one leg of thanksgiving. So that's why the Bible says, oh, that man should give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. He would, would give thanks. That is intentional to give thanks to God. You choose your attitude to give thanks just like you eat food. It's my choice to give thanks. 
There's plenty to complain about, isn't it? Yes. You can complain about everything. In England, we complain about the weather. The weather, the everything. Everything to complain about, but there's a lot to give thanks for. I'm a crazy thanksgiver to God. 90% of my prayer is thanksgiving. It is thanksgiving. Because what do you want to ask God for? It is thanksgiving. That you are, see, when we say it, you say, I thank God that I'm alive. No, no. You see, doctor's medicine can put you to sleep, but there's no medicine that can wake you up. I don't even get that one. You can take tablet to go to bed, but you cannot take tablet to wake up. Only God can wake you up. And so when you wake up in the morning, you say, no, no tablet wakes me up. It is God that wakes me up. That's why your appreciation and gratitude to God is not just that just I'm awake. They will have come and snuff your nose at night and you don't wake up. But you are awake. It's enough to thank God. If you don't know anything to thank God for, go back to when your mother conceived you. Do you know how many sperm that could have formed a cell to give back to you? All of them die, only one. God was. He said before you were formed. I was there. Anything could have happened to you in pregnancy. It didn't happen. During the time of birth, you could have been still bad or whatever, but they born you well. While you were young, you could have crawled into fire, but God allowed you to be. When you were in primary school, they could have kidnapped you or accident, but God kept you. When you were in secondary school, anything could have happened, God keep keeping, keeping, keeping you. When it was time for you to be grown and alive, God made sure you are. And then in your own iniquity and sin, and the world, he walked over to you by the blood of the Lamb. He cleansed you, he washed you, and he gave you a new life. Tell me, how would you give thanks to him? There's always a reason to give thanks to God. It's not in all what we eat, what we drink, where we are. We give thanks to him for that, but for the ability he has given unto us to be. If you don't remember that, the fact that you are on an eternal journey unto God, has anything happened today? You are not going to hell. You are going to be with him. What a privilege. So I don't know about you. Why don't you just give him? Give him all the praise. You give thanks all the time. In every situation and in all circumstances. A man called Matthew Henry was walking the streets of London. He was accosted by robbers. And he was robbed. They beat him. They took his clothes, they took most things, his bag, everything. He was bleeding. And he got home and he knocked the door. And his wife opened the door. His wife went like, oh my God, what? what? He said, no, 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 no. I want to give thanks. Who give thanks for being beaten? For being dis totally deserted? He said, you don't understand. He said, I'm not only giving thanks. I have four prayer points of giving thanks. He said, how could that be possible? He said, number one, I have not been robbed before. Now that I've been robbed, I give thanks. No, no, you don't understand that. So they said, but why? He said, as a pastor, I don't know what it looks like when people come to tell me they've been robbed. I only have sympathy, I don't have compassion. Uh, Oftentimes, God will let you go through what you are going through. So that you can be an example and a blessing for, to minister to people when they go through it. How can you reach out to people when they have not gone through, not gone through what they've gone through? How can you pray for them from your heart? He said, I've never been robbed before. He said, now that I've been robbed, I give thanks. Because it gives me a different understanding, a different spin. When I'm reaching out, I'm preaching to people. Sometimes things happen to you. It's not the apples to you so that you can give testimony and go. Pay attention. God has let it happen so that it can be a source of ministry. Yes. The day is coming when that you experience is going to encourage somebody. Amen. Give thanks. He said, the Bible says, in everything and in all situation, you give thanks. They take your job. Father, I thank you. Something happened that is whatever. Lord, I thank you. The Bible didn't say only when things are good. He said in all things and in every circumstance, in every situation, he said just give thanks. That's why I like Psalm 100, verse 4 in the Message Bible. One of the most revealing Bible texts to me 
He said the password to get to God's presence is thank you. No, no, that blew my mind from the day I got it. Hallelujah. You see, make yourself at home, talk in prayer, talk in worship. Enter, he said, enter with what? Password. Now, pay attention. If you take your phone or your laptop or whatever, you give it to your children, they cannot uh, unlock it unless they have what? They have what? The password. So God now says, the password for you to access me. The password to access me. The password to access me is not intercession. It's not anything. It's not. He said it's just. You just wake up every morning. You punch the tap word. The, 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 the password. Thank you. God say you ready. You ready. You are in my presence. What a, what a, what an amazing thing. The power of telling God thank you. Genuine appreciation and thank you to us to God. This guy said, they took my pulse, but they did not take my life. I give thanks to God. His wife was just looking at him. Are you serious? He said, is that not enough? He said, they took everything I had, but you know what? At the end of the day, it wasn't too much. And he said, lastly, they took everything. They robbed me, but I thank God that I'm not the one that robbed. Somebody else robbed me. Always find excuse to give thanks. Not to complain. That's what the Bible says. The Bible didn't say in everything, complain. He said in everything, in every situation, do what? Give thanks. Number two of this stand leg, he said our expression must come from praise and singing a melody unto God. There's something when your thanksgiving goes beyond just a thought of your heart. And things happened. And you need, I need to put my feet, that second feet on the, on the ground. You begin to praise and worship God. See, there is a praise and worship God when we have a church like this. You are joining. Do you ever praise and worship God at times when you are the only one that, 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 that wrote that song at that moment for yourself? Anybody been there before? You wrote the lyrics yourself at that particular moment. The melody that is going with it, you are the one that wrote it. Because it is your heart that is praising God at that moment. So the Bible did say to us that even in the reading of the on the Psalms, in, in the in the um in, in reading of the Psalms, in encouraging each other. So when people come and they say challenge, oh, come on, let, let's let's worship God, let's let's praise God. Let, so from our lips, we open the scripture, and it's a sign that we are praising God. Because oftentimes, Thanksgiving that comes with praise disturb the enemy. You don't believe me? Second Chronicles 20, 20 to 22 when Jehoshaphat was going to battle. It was a battle with three armies. There's no way he would have won. No way. But guess what God did? God said the army you want to take to the battle put them aside. Put the praise singer in the front. Then the army can follow. See as he read. He said, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing to the Lord and praise him in their holy priestly garments. I said, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambush towards the enemy. See, he said, as it begins. See, when your attitude becomes an attitude of praise that flows from your mouth, that flows from everything that you are, you are setting ambush into enemy's camp. Amen. When people want to set you up, Right? Oftentimes you go into intercession, which is great. But oftentimes, if you are close to God, God, God will say, This is not an intercession. This is a praise thing. Says, Jehoshaphat was praising. Praise the Lord. As they were praising, praising the Lord, singing. There's something came out of that praise and worship that the enemy thought to themselves, You are my enemy. You are not my, my collaborator. And they started to fight each other. They did not even pull out one. Uh, one, one article to fight the enemy. They fought themselves and destroyed themselves. By what reason? Because of the praise and the thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a dangerous stuff. A man, fear, don't fear much a man that can pray. Fear a man that can thank God. Because he will always find himself in the presence of God. When things are tough for you, when things are difficult for you, find an opportunity to give thanks to God. Ordinary people remembers when others says thank you. And God awaits us to say thank you to him at all time. He awaits us 
Psalm 126 verse 3 says, The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. It's not possible to forget what the Lord has done while we are anticipating what he's going to do. But we must always, always give thanks to him all the time. So the Bible talks about this particular thing about the, we are more than conquerors. You remember it in the book of Romans. See, there's a difference between those who are conquerors and those who are more than conquerors. Yeah, there's a lot of difference. You see, all my brothers and my sister that came to give testimony this morning, you are conquerors. Oh, yeah, yeah, you are conqueror. You have conquered. Amen. That's why you came out to give thanks to God and we testifying the goodness of God with you. But you know what? There are possible some people that should have come to give thanks, but they didn't. You know why? They are still going through these concerns. They are still going through the issues. It's not been solved yet. They still have pressure at work. They still cannot pay their fees. They still cannot do things. But you know, what makes the difference? If such people say, oh, I'll thank God for those who give thanks for what God has done. But he hasn't done it yet, but I want to give thanks. Ah, oh, you don't get what I'm saying. He's yes, yet to do it. But I'm a testifier. Because I believe that he's going to do it. So those are not just conquerors. Those who are what? More than what? It's a provocation. The enemy will not understand. Why are you giving thanks? You are about to get the letter that will terminate you, and you are giving thanks. You are about to get this and that, and you are giving thanks. Who give thanks for such a circumstance when things are not right? You are about to be, ever, to be exited from your house, and you are giving thanks. It's because you know what the enemy doesn't know. It's because you have God that nobody knows. So when you are giving thanks, they'll be saying, but why are you giving thanks? My, my kid is, is troubling me, but I want to give thanks because that kid is a man of God. I want to give thanks because that kid is a, is a, is a history maker and a world changer. But he said, but he doesn't look like it. But said, that's you. What I see is different from what you see. So I'm giving thanks ahead. I'm clearing the path ahead. God says, I get you. Am I making sense to you? You must be radical. In your understanding and appreciation of God as you give thanks to him. The last one, as we bring this to almost the end. The, the third leg of thanksgiving. It talks about not only what you think in your mind. And not only what you say. Then it talks about what you do. This is a demonstration by an action from you. So Psalm 50 verse 23 says this. He who brings an offering of praise and thanksgiving honors and glorifies me. And he who orders his way, all right, who prepares the way that I may show him, to him I will demonstrate the salvation of God. Psalm 54 verse 6. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks and praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Listen, what's this Bible text saying to us? Giving thanks to God goes beyond lip service. Giving thanks to God goes with something that you bring before God. Am I making sense to you? Because that is, that's why they call it, that is the sacrifice of thanksgiving that you are bringing unto him. Lip service is just to thank you. My kids can thank me. Thank you, dad. Thank you, dad. I say, it's okay. You can thank me. But if my kids goes out and find a one nice, I don't even know what to ask for. You know, find one nice, before I start mentioning some names, they will say I'm backslidden. Anyway, find some nice, <laughs> so like, like my brother came to do the announcement. I saw his shoe, I saw his belt. I said, that's Ferragamo. This guy is getting too much paid. You know, but if you can see, you can see. Some of us can see. Anyway, don't let me digress. I find something nice and say, Dad, I want to thank you. And I brought this for you. How many of you know it changes the dimension? Because you are not giving me thanks by your lips alone. Or in your heart. You are giving me thanks by the demonstration of what you do. And you are bringing something onto me. I can say thanks to pastor, but that's fine. But there's another level when I say, pastor, I want to thank you. But here it is. I am blessing you with these things. Don't, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just preaching the Bible. Yes. 
Right? I'm just saying that uh, it talks about also what you do. A demonstration of what you do. And I'll show it in the Bible. When David went to the house of Obedidom to go and to go and to go and get the ark of the covenant. He was so much joyful because the last time he was carrying the ark of the covenant, you understand what happened? One of the carriers died. He, he, he seek for information. They said, "No, no, no. The way you carry it was wrong. You have to carry it properly this time around." And they went to carry it. And for him, that God can allow me to carry this ark of covenant on his way to Jerusalem. And David began what I call extravagant. See, he must have taught it in his heart. Then he got all the praise singers with his mouth. And he thought, not only that, I have to demonstrate an action. So the Bible then reads in 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you read from 12 to 15. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obedidom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedidom to the city of David with rejoicing. And the Bible went further. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an horse and a fattened animal. See, as a theologian, when you unpack what that text means, it's mad. What that Bible says is that uh, David said, for this that God have allowed me to carry your presence back to Jerusalem. When they take six steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, bring me a calf, he will sacrifice it. Take another, I didn't say it, the Bible said it. Read it. Yes, it said for every six steps, he made a sacrifice. He was dancing so mad that his underpants was showing. His appreciation and gratitude to God was out of this world. He must have littered the whole road from the house of Obedidom to the city gate in Jerusalem with blood. Every calf, every cow, every camel, every sheep, every goat, he must have brought them. I imagine what the people will have been saying. King David, you've, run, you've ruined the economy. Everything thing that is of the animal husbandry, we've brought everything. You've sacrificed. Six, it's just six steps. Do you know what it means? He said, after every six step, six steps is sacrifice. It's only six steps. Do you know how many will sacrifice from this wall to that wall? Are you with me? Yes. And he began to sacrifice. If you now think of your life and God's blessing and grace upon your life, Think of six steps. Think of what God has done. Hallelujah. What are you sacrificing? Am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. This was a man that can think back. Because David would have thought, I don't need to be here. They chose everybody, but they didn't choose me. It takes Samuel to go and get me. Sacrifice. When nobody could defeat Goliath, I was the only one. And you did it for me. Sacrifice. When Saul was looking for me, and he appears that he got me, but you made me escape. Sacrifice. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. When you look back into your life, every six steps you take, you stop. Praise to you. Praise to you. Praise to you. Even if you don't have anything, you say praise to you. Because God is looking for those who are radical, who are crazy, who are mad, who are ready to say, let if my underpants need to show, let it show. But I cannot keep or hide God's blessing, God's grace, God's glory, God's favor, God's increase, God's anointing. God, oh, I can't keep it to myself. Six steps began to offer sacrifice unto God. Those are the people that understand. See, it's not only what you think now in your mind. It's not what you say. What do I bring as a sacrificial offering to what God has done for me? This was a man. No wonder God said, David is a man what? After my own heart. This guy has gone way. And if you think David has done that, let me show you what his son Solomon did. 
Second Chronicles chapter 7 from verses 4, 5, and 12. Just in summary. <laughs> The Solomon's offering and thanksgiving, it provokes God to show up at night. That's crazy. See, he, he gave God so much offering, God said, tonight, I'm going to wake you up. We need to talk. I'm going to give you the blueprint of success. The Bible says, then the king and the people offer sacrifice before the Lord. Watch this. It's not me. It's the Bible. He said King Solomon's offer sacrifice of 22,000 oxen. Now, now, not one, not ten, not two. Do you know do you know what oxen is? Big cow. Like a camel. 22,000. Solomon must be crazy. Now, 22,000 in money terms in pounds and dollars. Do you know how much that would have meant in those times? Is anybody listening to me? Yes, sir. And then the Bible went further. That not only 22,000, he said, I'm 120,000 sheep. What? 120,000 sheep. Do you know if you pack 120,000 sheep and 22,000 oxen? They will feel the whole of this mission. Mm -hmm. They just be ba 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 all over the place. It's too much. You just be hearing ba. They are more than the human beings, because the population of the world is not much that way. So it's one man and three oxen, one man and five sheep, and then Bible said Solomon did what? He sacrificed them. Not to himself. In the altar of God. God, I give you all of these things. It's possible that there's nothing left in the country. He has used everything available to sacrifice unto God. For what? Because it's not what I think. It's not what I say. But it's what I do. Are you getting me? Yes. And verse 12. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. And said to him, I've had your prayer. I have had your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Ah, may that be your story in Jesus' name. May that be your story in Jesus' name. What am I saying to you as I bring this to close, my brothers and my sisters? Learn the heart of being grateful to God from your heart. Don't let anybody pump you before you are grateful to God. You wake up in the morning. I like to say this. My children say, you don't say it some, again outside, but it's the truth. I have a chair. I just sent to my bed. And I just put pillows there. So in my mind, I imagine God sitting down there. Every house that I've lived, I've always had that chair. I put pillows there. They say, what chair is that? I say, it's God's chair. Because when I wake up in the morning, I put my feet down. I look at that chair. In my imagination, I see God. So I say, good morning, Dad. So he gives me the understanding that his presence is there and is forever. And then he starts an attitude of gratitude of thanksgiving unto God. Because I know I must press the password through thanksgiving at that particular moment in my life. You must be able to find a reason of gratitude unto God every day on a daily basis. Comes from your heart. And not only from your heart. You must be able in many ways to say it to people. I want to give thanks to God. Tell people. Share with people. Let people know what you are giving thanks to. Like the testimony we shared with our people today. Let people know what God is doing. Share testimonies with them. Share text with them. Sing and dance. Do you ever sing and dance on your own at home? Yes. Just dance for the Lord on your own. Oftentimes when I'm long in the bathroom, my wife will say, why are you wasting money, uh, uh, electricity? What? I, I said, the, the, you know when you lock yourself in that uh, cubicle in the bathroom and you shut the door? You're with nobody. You're just... You know, you are just 
And you say to me, your voice is not good. I said, the angels, they mix it. They just mix the voice. The, the vo it, it might not be good to you. I'm not singing it to you. The person I'm singing to, it got angels to be mixing the thing. Everything, you know, is synchronizing. And I'm enjoying it with the whatever. You must learn a safe place where the words of your mouth give praise to God. And the last thing, to, we should not be pumped to give money for thanks, to, to give, to bring offering or whatever for thanksgiving. See, the, there is so much happening in our world that money has become something that has been badly communicated in church because of leaders who have not been properly accountable or not telling the truth or not saying, see, the money, like Pastor was saying, the money we give in church is, is equivalent to what you give when you pay to, when you go to your gym. When you go there, they give you service. You pay monthly subscription. Is that not so? When you come to church, you hear the word of God, you sit under eating, you meet friends, and you go. Do you want to be getting that free all the time? They, if you are going to get, if gym does that, they will close down. Am I making sense to you? You belong to a golf club, but whatever. You pay to become a golf club, whether you go there or not. You pay your subscription. Because they use it to pay salary, pay the bills, pay everything. The same thing we are supposed to do in the house of God. That's just normal thing that we do as an act of responsibility. So all this tight, no tight, this one, whatever. Take, do your responsibility. If you belong to the house and you are benefiting from the house, then bless the house. Because sometimes you say, well, look at him, man of God. He's driving that car. He's doing whatever. Most of the time, men of God is not their money. It's people that they are blessed, that bless them. It's people that bless them. I know my brother has given six cars to different men of God. And I'm sure the people in their church will be thinking, pastor has stolen our money to go and buy car. I know so many that have been given houses as men of God. So, if you, for us as men of God, if we are honest and faithful, if you do this thing, God will bless you. But he also puts responsibility on the people as well. That for the work of God to continue, then we must be committed in terms of what we do. Because after that is a tight, your 10%, your clinical percent, you have to get to an understanding that by revelation is your giving. Let me repeat that. You can give by information. It's okay. You're a baby Christian. When you are giving by revelation, God tells you. Because everything you have belongs to him. Yes. I remember the first job I took. As I was taking the salary, God said, don't spend anything. He gave me the list of the people. Give everything out. That wasn't 10%. It was 100%. <laughs> give everything. When I left my last secular job, they paid me a very good money. When I left, very good money. Enough money to put down as a mortgage to buy a house. Very good money. God spoke to me, drop everything in church. I didn't, did I struggle? Yes. I thought it was the enemy from the village that I finally arrived that represented God. But it was God. How do I know? It was the days of the check. I was in church. I put my checkbook in my pocket. Because I told my wife that this is what God said. He said she said to me, do it. I said, I'm not doing it. This is one year uh, mortgage payment. Food and everything. Give everything. What about if I don't have a job in the next one year? So this woman is a very, she said, you know, I put the checkbook in my pocket and went to church like this. I was not ready. You think it's easy? No. They said, give cheerfully. That wasn't cheerful. I'm being vulnerable and honest. And they're rising around there. They have a, a, a pastor preaching like this on the day. He came and he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, it's like God is asking you to do something. And you are struggling with it. He said, what you need to do, do it now. But God then reminded me, you know, that thing. And then God reminded me that the, you don't need to go for a checkbook. is in your pocket. Ah. I said, I should have left this thing at home. At least I would have changed my mind before I get home. Brought the checkbook out. I'm talking about thousands. The whole of my account. Everything. 
wrote it, gave it to the church accountant sitting by my side. He said to me, it's not offering time. I said, do you think I'm giving offering? He said, but why are you frowning? I said, I'm not frowning, I'm crying. This is not giving in joy. There are sometimes you give in tears. But can I count what God has done? Because sometimes God will test you because of obedience. That wasn't 10%. It wasn't 20%. It was 100%. And they're going to leave. But when God meet you up, he will over meet you. So what we need, what all of you need to learn, is what is called the grace of generosity. When you learn the spirit and the grace of generosity, it is beyond, I'm tipping God. Bring your 10%. Bring this one. No! He owns everything. You ask him, Daddy, what should I give? Not only to the church. You look at some people, widows, orphans, people who have no opportunity. Maybe some, some couples struggling in church. They can't get caught for their children. Maybe some people who doesn't have things to do. They say, God, open. my prayer is, God, please open my eyes. Who I need to sow to nest. Please open my eyes. Who I need to give nest. It's a dangerous understanding of God's revelation of the gift he has given unto you. And people have different things which they do. I was telling pastor yesterday, I have three old women, 80, 85, and 90. I look after them. God said, go and look after them. Every month. I'll, when they pray for me, you see the prayer. I don't even read the prayers anymore. It's too long. But I know that is a revelatory giving. You don't know why you are doing it, but God is going to sort you out somewhere else. They are not related to me, but God said, look after them. Because our job is to look after widows, orphans, and then be responsible to where we call our home, the house of God. Because everything we have belongs to him first. Friends, don't take for granted the privilege and the opportunity to always give thanks to God. Radically. With everything that God has given unto you. With your voice, with your heart, with what he has placed in your hand. Let him be the ultimate. Bow your head with me. Why don't you just pray to God this morning? Start from the place of just thanking him. Look back to your life, what he has done. How far he has brought you. Where you are right now, just say, Lord, I come to yield and surrender unto you. I might not have thanked you enough. I might not have blessed and praised you. But today, I just say, Daddy, receive this thanksgiving from my heart, from my heart, from my heart, from my heart. Receive it from my heart. Let it flow from my heart. Ah, I'm not going to cover this up for all that you have done for me. Let my heart, let my mouth, let it be an instrument of praise and worship unto you. And today, God, with what you have placed in my hand, I want to use it to give thanks to you. I want to use it to worship you. Because there's nothing that I have that you didn't give first. It's out of what you have given unto me that I'm giving back unto you, Daddy. Please, do something new by the praise that flows from my mouth. And I pray for any man and woman here. You've gone off from this praise of God. If you are not even in God, I pray that you come back to the place of communion, the place of relationship, the place where Jesus becomes the center of your life in the name of Jesus. And I pray for many people here, yeah, you are sick or something is happening in your body, in your life, and you need healing. Let your reason of your thanksgiving, let it bring deliverance into your life in the name of Jesus. May your life never be the same again. Father, we thank and we bless you in Jesus.